in the attic. He played with bloody human organs and secretly plotted how to turn it into his own gaming sanctuary. Hello, welcome to my channel. There are going to be some specific information I mentioned that will be placed to the corner cards. Recently, a crime investigation drama, Who is Him? has been popular in China. The reason why it has attracted so much attention from the public is because it involves many shocking and mysterious unsolved cases, each of which has caused a sensation at the time. As our very first case in this channel, the buy-in case is one of the case prototypes in this TV series. Who is him? It uses the rainy night element as an auxiliary tool to advance the suspenseful part of the drama. So the first thing comes to mind for the audience is the most notorious case in Hong Kong in 1982, the rainy night butcher case. The terrible acts committed by the rainy night butcher Lam Govan or Ling Guoyun <laughs> and my Cantonese is really bad. Who sexually assaulted, murdered, and dismembered three women were extensively covered by the media and turned into movies and TV shows, especially Dr. Lam, which premiered in October 1992. However, despite being a depraved and insane murderer, some people idolized him and imitated his actions, leading to the rape and murder of 17 women. Today, we will talk about the story of Guangzhou's version of the rainy night butcher Luo Shu Biao. In 1954, Luo Shu Biao was born into a working class family in Guangzhou. His parents were busy with making ends meet, so he had relatively lax upbringing. After completing primary school, he experienced the turbulent special era of the Cultural Revolution, which began in 1966. By 1967, the Red Guards had escalated to the stage of ransacking homes, beating people, and destroying properties and the Communist Party and government authorities in Shanghai had been overthrown. Specific historical details I'm not going to discuss in this video, but if you're interested, you can search online yourself. At the time, the prevalent belief was that studying was useless and rebelling was justified. And Luo Shubiao's social cycle consisted of delinquent friends he began stealing from his classmates and their families for money during his school years. He was even brought to the police by a small shopkeeper, but because of his young age at the time, he was not sentenced to jail. His father tried to discipline him. He was beaten countless times by his father, yet he showed no regret. He went even further down the wrong path after graduation from secondary school in the year of 1970. And his habit of being lazy, greedy, and lustful led him from stealing small items to gradually stealing large, valuable items. His youth was marked by the unique times of China. As a secondary school graduate at the time, Luo Shubiao should have had a promising future. However, in 1974, he was arrested for theft and sentenced to two years of labor reform. The two years of labor education did not make him repent, but rather, he took even worse behaviors from his fellow inmates in prison. In the early hours of the 2nd of August, 1977, according to what law Shu Biao recalled, he climbed over the wall and entered the female dormitory of the Guangzhou Institute of Electrical Appliances. His original thought was to steal something, but when he saw this young woman, Feng Liyun, sleeping, 
this evil idea immediately popped out. He wanted to violate her. However, she resisted fiercely and shouted for help. As Luo Shubiao was small and weak, he couldn't subdue her. In a panic, while he strangled Feng with one hand, his the other hand grabbed an iron and punched Feng in the head until her brain bursted. Afterwards, with the stolen goods, Luo Shubiao climbed out of the window and left the dormitory. In the following days, he was very nervous and stayed at home, observing the police's reaction. At the time, the society was quite turbulent, having just ended the Cultural Revolution, and the police system was severely damaged by the Cultural Revolution. Their investigative ability was limited. The police only collected a few fingerprints found at the crime scene, and did not conduct further investigation, which allowed Luo Shubiao to escape the law. Two years after the murder, in 1979, Luo Shubiao was arrested again for theft and was sentenced to three years of labor reform. It was only committed theft, but police did not compare his fingerprints with the murder case in 1979 when he was taken to the prison. At that time, there was no relevant inference or request for case linkage, and the workload of manually comparing fingerprints was huge. So without any relevant clues, the police would not proactively conduct fingerprint comparisons without a specific target. And Luo Shubiao was indeed a thief in the prison, but no one suspected him of killing especially to that very case happened in After being released from prison in 1982, Luo Shubiao's parents arranged a marriage for him, and he married Liu Meiting, a gentle and honest person. They had a son and a daughter. But in February 1983, Luo Shubiao who had not changed his style of actions. He was arrested again for theft. In 1983, there was a strike hard campaign in China. Luo Shubiao was not sentenced to re-education through labor again, but was sentenced to five years in prison. Luo Shubiao's parents had hoped that he would change after getting married. Seeing that he had remained the same, they were extremely disappointed and decided to leave him alone and never intervened in his affairs anymore. Perhaps life in prison was too difficult or perhaps Luo Shubiao truly regretted. He behaved relatively well and was released early in 1987. During this time, his wife raised their two children alone, worked and took care of Luo Shubiao's parents. It was a very difficult time, but she never asked for a divorce and waited for Luo Shubiao to return. Luo Shubiao was very touched by her loyalty and promised to turn over a new leaf. As promised, Luo Shubiao did not steal again in the following days. He started with individual interior decoration work and then switched to working in transportation. Because he needed it, Luo Shubiao even bought a 0.6 ton mini chunk and moved to Xinjiang town, Haizhou district for his transportation business. During the seven years between 1987 and 1994, when he was arrested and executed, at least in the eyes of his wife and close friends, Luo Shubiao was honest and decent, except for occasionally the lusting of prostitution which was not yet strictly regulated at the time in China. And due to the developed economy in Guangzhou, it was surprisingly common. He did not smoke, not drink, not gamble, and lived quite fragily. However, like most serial killers, this was just a facade for Luo Shubiao in his daily life. Luo Shubiao repeatedly committed crimes and repeatedly got away with them. 
which was not unrelated to the negligence of his surroundings and families. After each murder, Luo Shubiao would often search the victim's body for cash, gold and silver jewelry, clothing and underwear. Therefore, the body he disposed of were often naked. In addition to selling some of the valuable items for money, he also gave a portion of them to his wife and children. However, his wife did not inquire about the origins of these old items and accepted them all. Once, Luo Shubiao gave his daughter a watch he took from a victim's body as a birthday gift. His daughter did not know the truth and still thought that the Luo Shubiao quoted was a good father Brad Winner. for giving me a watch on my birthday. As for Luo Shubiao's wife, she was a submissive rural woman who always felt that he was the main so she never and did. she was a few years older than Luo Shubiao, so she was afraid of being abandoned by him due to her age and declining beauty to interfere with any of his actions. At home, she was yielded for Luo Shubiao and only took care of growing vegetables and doing houseworks. She even ran a small grocery store selling cooked food to supplement the family's income. At first, when Luo Shubiao was out for prostitutes, she knew about it, but she didn't dare to interfere. Later, it developed into Luo Shubiao bringing prostitutes home to live with them, but she still didn't dare to speak up. As a result, Luo Shubiao became even more rampant. He renovated the house and turned the attic into his own world, not allowing his wife and children to come up. While well, the analysis here is far down to the story, let's go back to our timeline. During his three things in prison, Luo Shubiao often listened to details and experiences of how gangsters and rapists humiliated and harmed women, which made him feels very envious and yawnful. After his release from prison for theft in 1987, he would specifically seek out some obscene and perverted videos to watch in his spare time. Especially after Hong Kong began to rate films, the trend of category the third films with themes of pornography violence and crime spread to Guangzhou, making Luo Shubiao feel like a breath of fresh air. Among them, the influence of the Hong Kong rainy night butcher was the greatest and most profound on him. Luo Shubiao felt that the cases the Hong Kong rainy night butcher committed were very exciting and challenging and gradually developed a strong desire to imitate. Luo Shubiao satisfied his desire by vitally soliciting prostitutes while studying the plots and the videotapes. Furthermore, during this period, Luo Shubiao had developed a strong inclination towards stealing and collecting women's clothing that was hung outside to dry. According to his notebook, he had done this approximately 208 times. He also took discarded plastic mannequins from fashion stores, dressed them in the stolen clothes, and placed them in front of his bed to fulfill his sexual desires. With the belief that, quoted, doing it once is better than seeing it a thousand times, he was waiting for an opportunity. The evil in Luo Shubiao could no longer be suppressed and he began to stalk women who walked alone at night. He had to kill. On the evening of the 7th of February, 1990, after wandering around for more than two hours, Luo Shubiao found his target, a 22-year-old woman named Zhong, who missed her bus and was walking to another bus stop. At this time, Luo Shubiao had just finished watching pornographic videos and his lust was at its peak. 
when he saw Zhong, who had a curvaceous figure and long hair, he became aroused and drove up to her with a silly smile, asking her where she was going. He followed Zhong's lead and offered to give her a ride. Zhong thought that he looked honest and got into his passenger side. After driving to the remote stone quarry near the new district diary farm, which Luo Shubiao had already planned as his crime scene, his true nature was exposed. He stopped the car and attempted to violate it, Zhong. However, Zhong fought back fiercely due to her physical strength, and Luo Shubiao had no choice but to strangle her to death. He then drove into the banana plantation and raped the cops crazily before tossing the body into the grass outside of a factory far away from her home. Although it wasn't his first murder, Luo Shubiao was still quite frightened. The next morning, he went to where the body was disposed to check and saw a group of police officers and onlookers. So he fled away. He did not commit any further crimes in the following year. One year later, in 1991, Luo Shubiao regained his courage and began to evaluate the police methods of investigation. It seemed that the police only solved cases with casual relationships. So if I didn't know the victim, they couldn't catch me and I could continue my last. Thinking that he had superior intelligence to the police, Luo Shubiao became extremely arrogant. He had become familiar with the basic process of police investigations during his previous three convictions, although he was caught theft only in the past. Earlier, we mentioned that Luo Shubiao often patronized prostitutes, but due to his financial situation, he could only afford those cheap street workers. The experience of killing Zhong made him focus his attention on these karaoke girls who engage in sexual transactions in KTVs or nightclubs. Karaoke girls normally had more financial income than street workers. At that time, Guangzhou's economy was thriving, hence attracted many prostitutes that from out of the town, and they were vulnerable to their clients. On the 10th of February 1991, while visiting a prostitute, that woman was displeased by his rough actions. So she made a few complaints, which caused Luo Shubiao to become enraged. In the course of the argument, Luo Shubiao choked a woman to death and then raped her body several times before dumping it in the wilderness. Half a year had passed since the last crime. Luo Shubiao committed another crime because during this half year interval, the police had taken no action. Luo Shubiao believed that he could not possibly be caught, so he began to act recklessly. In October, the police found the body of a young woman, naked and abandoned in the grass by the roadside. Her breasts and part of her skin had been cut off and taken away by the murderer. According to the forensics, the perpetrator had used a fruit knife to cut her up, but he was very unskilled, and it took at least two hours for him to finish the work. The victim was raped, then killed, and her body was violated by the murderer as well. Starting from the 7th of February 1990, this was the third case of its kind. Apparently, they didn't notice one in 1977, since it is from Luo Shubiao's confession after he was arrested. 
and it was done differently than the cases happened after the 90s. And the Guangdong Public Security Bureau started to investigate it by searching for missing persons. However, they found no clues, and the victims' families and friends never reported them missing. Luo Shubiao started to kill one person every three to two months. His killing interval was half a year before, which indicates a further escalation of his criminal methods and twisted psychology. In October 1991, the fourth case, the victim, also in her early 20s, was raped several times before and after her death. This time, the victim was put in a sack and left on the side of the road, with a large area of skin on her back, both breasts, and her vulva were cut away. Her entire body looking like it had been slaughtered. From this point on, this case was listed as the top priority case to be solved in the city of Guangzhou. All levels of public security agencies, including police stations and precincts, used every means available, including investigating suspicious individuals, getting up roadblocks, patrolling, ambushing, and repeatedly analyzing forensic evidence. However, they only found one lead. There was a small four-wheeled freight truck at the scene. Of the crime in October 1991. Unfortunately, at that time, the developed city of Guangzhou had tens of thousands of such trucks. While the extensive investigation was ongoing, Luo Shubiao continued to commit crimes frantically with even greater recklessness. From the October 1991 to the end of 1991, Luo Shubiao killed two more women. And both were raped before and after death. Their breasts, skin, and pubic area were all cut off by the murderer. Despite efforts to block the news, many people still knew that there was a psycho killer in Guangzhou who mutilated and killed young and beautiful girls. As a result, many young women were afraid to go out alone at night. By the end of December 1992, ten women had been murdered by Luo Shubiao, all were dumped in sacks, with the vast majority having had part of their bodies cut off, mainly their breasts and pubic areas. When Luo Shubiao visited prostitutes, he brutally killed all those who disobeyed him, those who resisted his brutal actions, those who asked him to wear condoms, those who did not allow him to rape them twice, and those who checked his license plates when getting into his car. Each time the girl was killed, Luo Shubiao used his minivan to drive the body home. And carry up to the attic where he lived alone, raped the body several times in a row. The attic was added on top of the first floor of the house, and built much later, like we have mentioned earlier. His wife and children lived on the first floor. During the day, Luo Shubiao would lock the attic and forbid his family from entering. Claiming that he was using chemicals for his woodworking projects at night, in the attic, he played with bloody human organs and secretly plotted how to turn it into his own gaming sanctuary. At first, he was raping bodies, but then he had killed too many people, and he came up with more tricks. Luo Shubiao began to imitate the episode of the Rainy Night Butcher video, where he 
took off the breast and vulva of some victims with a knife and soaked them into a glass bottle for his collection. The other skin tissue that were cut off were attached to plastic models that he had picked up from fashion shops. He welded them with wires and the clothes of the deceased were put on the plastic models and he would admire alone. The disposed bodies were packed separately in sacks, oil drums and wooden cracks before being transported in his own vehicles to the wilderness for disposal. I guess at this point you may wonder if the police did have conducted several large-scale investigations, why would they just miss Luo Shubiao? After Luo Shubiao's release from prison in 1987, he had not committed any crimes and usually pretended to be honest and cowardly, so the police would not take him seriously. As for the police checkpoints, Luo Shubiao had them all in back. He was a local and knew the area well enough, so he was able to drive through police checkpoints and inspection booths in the early morning hours, using secluded alleys. He calmly disposed of the bodies right under the police's nose. The only accident was in 1992, when he accidentally dropped a body while loading it onto his vehicle late at night. His wife was still awake because their son was having a fever. She saw it and screamed. Luo Shubiao was very nervous and lied to his wife that he accidentally hit the woman while driving at night and she died due to excessive bleeding on the way to the hospital. He said he was feared that he would have to pay for compensations and decided to disperse the body. Surprisingly, his wife believed him. It is unclear whether she actually believed him. According to his later confession, Every time he successfully committed a crime, Luo Shubiao experienced a feeling of unrestrained freedom and ecstasy. After murders, he would spend the night in his own bed with the female cops, and he would stuff his own underwear and socks inside the vagina and mouth of some of the victims, deliberately leaving his semen inside to see if the police were able to find out and play a game of death with the police. After committing crimes, Luo Shubiao would record the physical features of each victim, the style of clothes, the rapes, his feelings, and process of dumping the body in details in his notebook for later review. The notebooks were later destroyed and rewritten in online form because he heard that the police were investigating very closely. On the night of 25th of May 1992, as luck would have it, despite the ongoing citywide DNA testing to identify the killer, his meek which he was also subjected appearance. to a detention for being caught selecting prostitution. He was again overlooked by the police because It was surprising that despite the lengthy checkpoint operations, a local person who was familiar with the terrain was still able to commit murder. What I meant was, the police should have shifted targets to locals rather than the city newcomers who know nothing about these secret alleys. It was even more incredible that the police didn't suspect someone like Luo Shubiao who had a criminal record and did not even collect his fingerprints. At that time, Guangzhou had just started reform and opening up, and most of the offenders were, you know, people from outside of the town. Therefore, due to bias, the police did not consider Luo Shubiao as a suspect and did not pay enough attention to him. In November 1992, after being released from the Reformation School, Luo Shubiao continued his crimes until the end of 1993, and the number of victims reached 15.
By September 1994, the number of victims had reached 19, with four killings taking place between March and September 1994 alone. What did the police do during these years? After spending four years seeking help from several criminal investigation experts from the Ministry of Public Security, they finally made some progress. The experts found that although most of the victims were naked, some still wore fake jewelries, such as bracelets, earrings, and rings that looked like they were made of gold. In the entire city of Guangzhou, only one group of women will wear a large amount of such expensive-looking fake jewelries, and that was sex workers because their work was very dangerous and they were often beaten and robbed. One of the rules for sex workers was to wear one or two fake pieces of jewelry to give away and save their lives when being robbed. Some robbers who were not knowledgeable about jewelry often took the money and left. Based on this judgment, and because the victims had mostly dyed their hair, painted their nails, and were all young women, they finally solved what seemed to be the most difficult problem, determining the victim's profession. This also explains why, for so many years, most of the victim's identities could not be found, and there were no related family members reporting them missing. Why did almost all the victims not resist when they were first raped by the killer? It seems that the killer disguised himself as a client, and they engaged in sexual transactions. Sex workers would naturally not resist. By the time the killer suddenly attacked, it was already too late to resist. There were two sex worker victims were identified. The investigators looked into the clients they knew. The victim's phone book contained contact information over 200 men. The investigation team had no choice but to visit each of them one by one. They discovered people from all walks of life, ranging from high-ranking officers, teachers, and even some judicial staff, to migrant workers, vendors, and peasants. After repeated investigation and DNA testing, all 200 men were ruled out as suspects. During this time, the police also solved 86 other criminal cases, including two serial murder and dismemberment cases. However, they still could not solve this particular case. It seemed to have reached a dead end. For a while, especially in the vicinity of the crime scene, women of all ages, from 80-year-old grandmothers to 8-year-old children, were afraid to go out alone. They needed male relatives or friends to escort them to work or school. Rumors circulated, some saying that the killer only targeted the women in red clothing, causing a drop in sales of red clothing and shoes in the area. Others said that the killer targeted women with long hair, causing a rush of women to cut their hair short, making their salons overcrowded. The Guangzhou police were criticized for their incompetence, and the criticism was widely reported in the media, including to Hong Kong. Due to its similarity to the Hong Kong rainy night butcher case and the higher number of victims, the Hong Kong media sensationalized the Guangzhou rainy night butcher case, with some newspapers even writing novels and stories about it. That being said, by September 1994, Luo Shubiao had already taken the lives of 19 people. Gradually losing interest in killing escorts, he felt that it was too easy to target these individuals and lacked challenge. Therefore, he attempted to target women in legitimate professions. On the 18th of September 1994, Luo Shubiao disguised himself as a taxi driver and solicited passengers near Guangzhou railway station. At midnight, he found what he thought was a suitable target, a petite young woman from Hunan named Huang Yanhong. 
Luoshu Biao used a lower fear as bait and deceived Huang into getting into his car. What Luo Shubiao didn't expect was that Huang Yanhong was not an ordinary young woman, but rather from a family of acrobats. She had practiced acrobatics under her father's supervision since childhood and worked in an acrobat troupe as an adult, eventually marrying one of the members. The troupe's business was not good, so Huang Yanhong's husband decided to give up the acrobats and started a business in Guangzhou City. A year later, Huang Yanhong's husband opened a snack shop in Guangzhou, and the business was doing well, so he called Huang Yanhong and asked her to come to Guangzhou to live with him. Huang Yanhong took the train to Guangzhou and encountered Luo Shubiao, who appeared to be an honest driver. Upon arriving in the unfamiliar city of Guangzhou, Huang Yanhong was still somewhat wary of Luo Shubiao. Once the car reached a relatively deserted area, she kept asking where they were and requested that he drive to a more populated area. Luo Shubiao attempted several times to drive the car to a desolate area, but each time Huang Yanhong spoke loudly and even shouted, preventing from succeeding. Frustrated, Luo Shubiao changed his plan and decided to attack her at his own home. He lied and said that he needed to go home to get something for his son and drove Huang Yanhong to his home in Xinjiao town, where he invited her to come upstairs and meet his two children. Huang Yanhong was deceived by Luo Shubiao's timid appearance and thought that he was a coward and posed no threat, so he agreed to go upstairs. I found it weird though, you know, this, 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 this plot. But anyway, that's how it happened, they said on the documents I read. Once they reached the attic, Luo Shubiao revealed his true nature and suddenly strangled her with a rope from behind. Huang Yanhong was caught off guard and quickly passed out. Luo Shubiao thought she was dead and then raped the cops. Afterwards, Luo Shubiao went downstairs to get her back to dispose the body. And only then did Huang Yanhong slowly regain consciousness. She was naked, her neck was in great pain. The attic was 5 meters high and Luo Shubiao's countyard wall was 4 meters high, with many glass fragments on top. If it had been an ordinary woman, she would have undoubtedly died. Fortunately, Huang Yanhong was a trained acrobat with strong climbing skills. Despite being naked, she used her elbow to break the glass window, crawled out through the window, and with the acrobatic skills, she had acquired over the years. She easily climbed down the attic and climbed up the four meter high wall, eventually climbing over it and escaping. During her escape, her palms were cut by the glass shots and were bleeding profusely, but she didn't care. After escaping, Huang Yanhong was confused about the situation. She did not dare to run around randomly. Instead, she hid in an abandoned house where nobody lived in. The next morning, she finally breathed up and came out of the house and met an old lady who was buying breakfast. The old lady was shocked when she saw Huang Yanhong naked and not even wearing underwear. The old lady quickly took her back to her place and gave her a coat and a pair of underwear. After calming down, Huang Yanhong decided to report to the police. On the 19th of September 1994, at 8 o'clock in the morning, with the guidance of the old lady, Huang Yanhong rushed into the police station, report the situation to the chef Lu. Chef Lu was shocked and based on Huang Yanhong's recollection, with two police officers carrying guns, they searched Luo Shubiao's home. As soon as they entered the yard, one or two mini trucks parked there, but they went straight to the attic. After breaking open the door lock, Shiv looked saw the handbag Huang Yanhong had mentioned 
on the table at a glance. There were piles of women's clothes on the bed, and there were hundreds of women's panties and bras with traces of bears in the bedside table. While Chef Lu was inspecting this underwear, the other police officer became interested in the locked wardrobe. The wardrobe was very large, and there were two large locks on the door. The police officer used a hammer to smash it for a long time before opening it. However, as soon as he took a glance, the young police officer in his early twenties suddenly covered his mouth with his hand and ran down the stairs quickly, vomiting violently. Chief Lu thought this young man was fake, and he also took a look inside the wardrobe and was stunned. In front of him, the more than ten large glass jars containing colored female breasts. And genitals. There were also a female model made of fire, covered in multiple pieces of sewn together skin. Since he had dealt with many cases, Chef Lute felt immediately that it was human skin. For a moment, he also felt a surge in his stomach. It was obvious that Lu Shubiao was the killer behind these serial cases, the perverted murderer who cut off women's breasts. And genitals. Then Chief Lu made a phone call, and began to mobilize police forces. Under his persuasion, Lu Shubiao's wife Liu Meiting agreed to cooperate with the police in his arrest. Let's rewind a bit、um, to the story where Lu Shubiao was going downstairs to grab his bags after he returned to the attic. Lu Shubiao found that Huang Yanhong was. Gone. He was shocked and nervous instantly. He knew that the truth would soon be exposed, so he grabbed his wallet and fled to town in a hurry. In order to avoid exposure, he didn't even dare to drive a car. After arriving to the train station, Lu Shubiao realized that he only had a few dozen yuan left in his wallet. This amount of money would only buy a train ticket and a few meals. Then he would starve to die. Helplessly, he made a phone call back home to inquire about the situation, and then asked his wife to deliver a deposit to a place near the train station. However, the police who received the report had already taken measures, and soon captured him. After his arrest, the Guangzhou Police Security Bureau immediately collected Lu Shubiao's DNA samples and fingerprints and compared them with. Footprints and tire tracks found at the scene, which matched perfectly. Lu Shubiao knew he had committed too many murders, and the evidence was conclusive. So he did not resist and quickly confessed his criminal history over the years. Only twenty days after being imprisoned, the Guangzhou People's Court sentenced Lu Shubiao to death and immediately carried out the sentence. Lu Shubiao did not appeal. So on the twentieth of January, nineteen ninety-five, Lu Shubiao was executed. Sadly, until the case was solved, two thirds of the victims, who were sex workers, still remained unidentified, and some of their bodies could not even be found to be cremated and buried due to their incomplete remains. The police even found the names and addresses of some of the victims, but when they went to the victims' parents to ask them to collect the bodies, the families refused to acknowledge that the victims were their daughters, and refused to take the bodies. In conservative rural areas, having a daughter who worked as a sex worker was considered a disgrace for the entire family. And no one wanted to admit it. There are some similarities for women living in Oriental Asian countries. I have read a book called Tokyo Poverty Women by him. This book records the stories of several female sex workers in Tokyo. Regardless of their backgrounds, most of them entered the sex industry because of the economic difficulties they faced. Once they entered this industry, it was extremely difficult for them to leave. 
external factors and public opinions may not be the key to their situation, but rather their own thoughts can change. When they have earned relatively easy money and have escaped from their previous financial difficulties, they find it difficult to readjust their mindset and engage in normal, slow-paying jobs. The problems faced by sex workers are indeed too complex, and it is not something that I can easily solve or discuss here. I hope to have the opportunity to discuss this topic appropriately in the future. This serial case ended here, but it sparked a lot of discussions. Some questioned the investigative abilities, while others criticized the negative influence of the excessive sex, violence, and crime elements in the Hong Kong produced in category third movies in the 1990s. However, the impact of entertainment products such as the、uh, category third films on social issues, including but not limited. To films or television, it's still a highly debatable topic today. I will leave this as a topic for discussion in the future, if we have the opportunity, of course. Okay, though, let's briefly go through his interesting criminal psychology. I don't like to hear things that don't please me. As long as she dares to speak, I can guarantee that she will die that night. By Luo Shubiao. When Luo Shubiao killed each victim, there was no room for emotions, sympathy, or mercy. If the victim showed even the slightest bit of non-compliance or disadvantageous behavior, it would immediately trigger his killing intent without hesitation. But this cold-blooded killer was described by his cousin and mother as someone who. Wouldn't even dare to kill a chicken. When Luo Shubiao was in secondary school, he was very close to a classmate named Li. Li recorded that on one occasion they went out together, and Luo Shubiao seemed to sense that his friend was very thirsty, but had no money. So he immediately stole a bottle of drink from a kiosk for him. However, he was caught by the shopkeeper. And bitten, and this incident left a deep impression to Li. In his eyes, although Luo Shubiao liked to do bad things, he was indeed a very loyal friend. As a parent, Luo Shubiao placed great emphasis on his children's education and checked their homework every day. He could be considered a responsible father. After Luo Shubiao was arrested, the police asked his wife. What kind of person her husband was? She said that Luo Shubiao was good to her and considerate because he had contracted a STD from visiting prostitutes. He would not have sex with his wife and was afraid of passing the disease to her. The main components of Luo Shubiao's criminal psychology are extreme and complex sexual deviation disorders, the killing desire of a serial killer. Antisocial personality disorder, which is ASPD, and narcissistic personality disorder, which is NPD. The sexual deviation disorders of Luo Shubiao, which include necrophilia and fetishism as the main components, and sadomasochism as a secondary component. Before the beginning of his series of murders, the main types of paraphilias that Luo Shubiao had were. Fetishism and necrophilia. He enjoyed collecting women's clothing for self gratification, and liked to have sex with prostitutes who act like corpses, which could enhance his sexual pleasure. However, after his first murder, he successfully had sex with a corpse for the first time, which reinforced his necrophilia. At the same time, a new type of Paraphilia, sadistic paraphilia, began to emerge. The reason why Luo Shubiao developed sadistic paraphilia is due to the lent pattern that we will talk about. It refers to the fact that through the influence of various complex personality disorders, the criminal finds other ways to satisfy and enhance their criminal pleasure 
during the commission of a crime through learning and self-experimentation, which forms and reinforces their need for that specific behavior. The reason why Luo Shubiao idolized the Hong Kong Ring Nine killer and the serial killers in the videotapes was not unfounded, because these people were similar to him in many ways. The Hong Kong killer was obsessed with corpses, cutting off the genital organs of the bodies to making them into specimens and treating them as his masterpieces. He was a complete necrophilia serial killer, and Luo Shubiao was just like him. Therefore, after killing, Luo Shubiao would mimic this Hong Kong killer with the cutting and collecting behaviors. Luo Shubiao wanted to play a game with the police. Seeking a magnified sense of self-approval through various evasive tactics, starting from the first case of murder and necrophilia, the Guangzhou police began a large-scale investigation and evidence collection operation. Although the semen of the culprit was found in the victim's vaginas in many cases, DNA identification in the field of criminal investigation was still very immature in Guangzhou at the time. So these pieces of evidence were not utilized well. All of these were very clear to the lurking Luo Shubiao, and for every day that the police did not investigate him, he felt a very exciting sensation. Every day that he could pass without being caught, he felt that he had gained the upper hand in the games. After example of his inflated self-esteem, including intentionally leaving his semen in the victim's genitalia. Which could have been cleaned but wasn't, and was stuffing his own underwear into the victim's genitalia in some cases. To him, that was a game that came at the cost of more victims' lives. And as someone who thought highly of himself and had a sky-high IQ, he saw himself as the master of this game. At the beginning of Luo Shubiao's serial killings. His dual personality was not apparent. He would feel nervous when committing the crime and would not leave his home after the crime due to fear of the police investigation. This was very disharmonious and undesirable psychological state that even affected his normal life. However, due to the emergence of complex personality disorders such as ASPD, he. Continuously experienced violent impulses with sexual drive during the cooling off period, and he was unable to restrain the strong criminal impulse. As a result, there was a fierce conflict between the motivation to obtain criminal pleasure through killing and mutilating corpses, and the desire to live a normal life with his families. This conflict caused. Great anxiety to Luo Shubiao, due to parasitic disorder and ASPD. This desire can be very harmful and unpredictable, like a white horse that can lead to a criminal behavior at any moment. Each impulse that appears will intensify the discomfort caused by the contradictions mentioned above. Over time, this discomfort transformed into a deep anxiety that can cause damage to a person's mental and physical health. Luo Shubiao's inherent nature was someone with ASPD, as marked by an extreme sense of self-centeredness and selfishness, which also manifests in his intense self-protective tendencies. He would not allow this kind of harm to himself to continue happening. In order to avoid internal damage caused by contradictions, Luo Shubiao must find ways to prevent similar conflicts from occurring. In other words, he must be able to live a normal life while not committing crimes. But how could he do that? The compulsory and habitual separation of psychological states during crime and everyday life. However, achieving this separation is not an easy task. First of all. Luo Shubiao must consciously forget the criminal process and psychological activities related to killing and mutilating during his crimes. But he cannot bear to forget, because this is something he needed 
to constantly recall as a serial killer, then what can he do? Write it down. Write it down in a notebook so that even if he compulsively forgets, he can retrieve it and recall it. So everything went smoothly. These violent tendencies were gradually forced into Lord Shubert's subconscious. As a result, there was a strong aggregation between his inherent selfish, cold, and cruel personality, and the violent tendencies in his subconscious forming a destructive personality. The destructive personality is convenient for satisfying his criminal desires in the subconscious, while the protective personality is presented in front of everyone, serving the purpose of allowing him to have a normal psychological and behavioral performance in his everyday life. Therefore, a two-faced person was created. When certain specific situations arise, the two personalities alternate. The protective personality will recede, and the conscious layer will be dominated by the destructive personality driven by the desire to commit crimes. For instance, if Luo Shubiao gets easily annoyed over minor issues, and he comes across a young woman who fits his criteria, his destructive tendencies may be triggered, leading him to formulate a plan to lure and kill her. Many serial killers probably share similar characteristics, and as someone without a background in relevant psychiatric disciplines, I am perhaps out of my depths. Let's wrap up our story here. Thanks for watching for this very long case. I see you in the next one.